Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Branvold, and as always, Jay Gilbert is joining me as well. Good morning. Uh, we need to re- Do we need to remind people? I don't think we need to remind people, but we need to show some love. We've got some amazing yeah. sponsors that, that sure have been do. supporting us. First and foremost, Bruce, everybody over at HypeBot, um, great you, support. Bruce. Head over to HypeBot.com. And, of course, bands in town. Um, we've praised bands in town so much. If you're not tracking tour dates and using bands in town, you've got to take a look at it. And, of course, we are now brought to you by Bandzoogle. From garage bands to Grammy Yay. winners, Bandzoogle powers the websites for thousands of musicians around the world. Their simple step-by-step system will get you online in minutes. Choose from dozens of mobile-friendly templates, then customize your design and content in just a few clicks. It's built for musicians, by musicians. Bandzoogle has all the features you need for your website and EPK already built, including a merch and download store to sell music and merchandise, commission-free, a tour calendar to promote your shows and sell tickets, commission-free, (laughs) <laughs> mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters. And, of course, integrations with other services like Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and great live support. Uh, yeah. Banzoogle has plans starting at $8.29 a month, which includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. Go over to Banzoogle.com, start your 30-day free trial, and be sure to use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY. By the way, Michael, last week I said I was going to build a site with Banzoogle. I did build my first site. It took me about an hour, and it looks just as pro as anything on the web. So I'm telling people you don't have to know code. You know, it's a drag-and-drop kind of situation and all the that functionality that michael just mentioned give it a shot you yep. can try it for free yep so um this week we have a very cool special guest joining us michael from feature dot fm sits down with us talks about their suite of marketing tools and i'm a, i'm very excited to learn about the advertising suite that they offer in yeah. spon- you can basically put your song out there as a sponsored song. Yeah, like an ad, but they yeah, play the whole song. They play the whole song for Real you. Real listeners. Yep, yep. So let it roll, Michael from feature.fm. Build a stunning band website in minutes with Bandzoogle. Go to bandzoogle.com to start your free 30-day trial and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Today we have Michael Sherman, Director of Business Development from Beach FM. Um, Michael, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. So I, I'm a big fan of Feature FM, and there's so many capabilities that I'm learning about that I never knew about. But for people who have never heard of uh, what it is that this company is and what you do, kind of give people the the elevator pitch. Like, wh- what does Feature FM do? Yeah, sure. Um, so Feature FM at its core is a technology company, but unlike other technology companies in music, we're not here trying to shove a square peg into a round hole. We've built consultatively with partners in music to uh, conceptualize and bring to market an all-in-one digital marketing and advertising platform. So uh, in short, instead of being in a bunch of different platforms to activate a bunch of different digital marketing or advertising objectives or techniques, uh, we centralize them. In turn, data becomes centralized. In turn, cost is more effectively spent. Uh, And you as an organization, for us, it's labels, distributors, artists, uh, have a more efficient workflow. I started learning about you through uh, uh, InGrooves, and who are one of your partners. And initially, it was because of these, you know, kind of smart URLs, right? Mm-hmm. You can have uh, a, a URL that uh, somebody clicks on, and it comes up with all the different digital service providers and any other destinations you want to have on there. And you can put 
one simple URL in your socials and your ECRM and that sort of thing for people who don't know. But one of the things that I thought was really cool about it is if you did a pre-save, pre-add, pre-order kind of link early, then kind of automatically on street date that flips and it becomes, you know, out now, listen here, stream here. Can you talk a little bit about those smart URLs and how, how people are using those? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the genesis of this was that, you know, we're living in a multi-platform world, right? And it's just proliferating more and more. And depending on what region or genre or any other kind of, you know, variation, uh, you may want to listen to music in a different way. And so that was the genesis of a, of a smart link, right? But behind it is all of the remarketing that kind of drives these things where, you know, you go shopping for something online and that thing follows you around everywhere on the internet. Well, music has, uh, has started to catch up to that in some respects in the way that people are running digital marketing and advertising. And so the smart link page is a good, you know, for lack of a better word, facade for um, those that are interested in running digital advertising to understand who they should be targeting with those ads. Uh, in addition to providing fans and audiences, um, you know, optionality for digital streaming platforms. So that was, again, the genesis of the smart link. But that only is really applicable after a release comes out. And so we spent a lot of time understanding what objectives look like before a release comes out. And for many folks, it's for Spotify release radar or any of the other kind of algorithmic but user-based playlists mm -hmm. to drive recommendations around content. And the way that they can more accurately do that around the new release is to get followers and fans and such. And so that was the initial thinking around pre-save. Um, it's been around for several years in various iterations, but other platforms are now opening up this concept for pre-release marketing. And so Feature FM has expanded pre-save to pre-save with Spotify, pre-add with Apple, and pre-save with Deezer. So we're across all three major DSPs that provide this kind of pre-marketing. But we also offer, like you said, pre-order on any of the other kind of physical stores like an Amazon or Beatport. And but also, you, doesn't it give you the uh, functionality of kind of automatically following the artist? That's right. So with Spotify specifically, uh, our users can determine what action the fan will take after they pre-save a song. So if you want to gamify it by sending them to, you know, unlisted video content or a pre-sale for an upcoming tour, by all means. If you want to do it to kind of drive a, a strategy around growing a playlist or an artist following, we also allow for a multiple follow functionality so that when, when the fan clicks just in one click, they pre-save pre the song so that it will appear in their library on release day, but we also allow them to follow whatever it is the user determines is worth following, fan, playlist, user. And again, all of this is GDPR compliant and above board, so the fan can opt out if they want to, of course. Um, that needs to be mandated, but the, um, the, the kind of ways that you can leverage this technology to drive pre-release marketing initiatives is quite interesting. But to your point, it will switch to a smart bank upon release. So these digital marketers are not out there in one platform building a pre-save and then in another platform building a smart link where now you have two discrepant data sets, whether it's first party data capture, right? When someone pre-saves a song on Spotify, they can opt to give their first name, their last name, their email address, things that are identifiable if they choose to. But for a smart link, you get third party data. And so when you're disjointed between these platforms, so is your data. And so is the kind of granularity of that data. So not only does switching from a pre-save to a smart link save the marketer time, but it will integrate the data that you're capturing pre-release, post-release. So you can be a little bit more effective and efficient in the way that you, you market to those fans. Um, I, I, I think I recall, I just got an email maybe just this week about some new features that you guys um, are promoting and pushing, one of them being email address captures within Apple. That's right. Yeah. So Apple's always been really bullish about data, right? Because they're not just a, a streaming provider. We're likely on Apple computers. Here's an Apple phone. You know, it's they have a whole other business. So they have kind of different privacy um, parameters, if you will. And so when it comes to Apple Music, 
they're not ones to pass back email addresses for those that pre-add. Um, that doesn't mean, in our opinion, that a fan should not be given the option to give an email address. Again, if you're running a contest, for example, and you want to notify a winner, you need to be able to communicate with them. If the contest is pre-adding, and let's say you use Spotify and you use Apple, you shouldn't be precluded from entering a contest because pre-adding on Apple doesn't provide an email address back. And so we've built a functionality that no matter where you're allowing a fan to pre-save, you're allowing them to give you, the fan, their email address as well for future communications if they so choose. So historically, that's not been something that's been ever tied to Apple, um, mostly Spotify. But the, the thinking here is that the more identifiable information you get when fans take actions or the greater behavioral understanding of their listening, then you can start building you know, a, a CRM around the ways that these fans operate. So yeah. whether it's Apple, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Deezer, whether it's YouTube, we're totally platform agnostic because fans are across multiple platforms. But in order to market to them, you too need to understand who they are and where they consume music. So um, yeah, we're thinking about things in a, in a pretty horizontal fashion. Yeah, you know, they, they say that, you know, half your advertising doesn't work. You just don't know which half. And what yeah. what's really cool is we did this thing. We, we did a print ad with a major yeah. publication, and we took five artists, and we created uh, the links for those artists for yeah. that. And what was really great is the publication used those, and we could actually see uh, some really great, you know, open rates, click-through rates, you know, yeah. the behavior. And one of the things I'd love to kind of have you tell the audience about is that data that you get on the backside okay. is so valuable. Can you speak to some of those different metrics that you can uh, get and what you can learn from those? Yeah, sure. And, and to be clear, a lot of the data uh, at first glance is pretty easy to digest, but for the more, let's say, advanced digital marketers, much of the data will appear in their respective remarketing platforms of choice, right? So you can go take the data that, you know, you generate on a smart link and understand that you want to advertise to only people that have clicked on Spotify or Apple or from France or any of these things, right? You can get very granular in your remarketing. Right. But for what we present in our platform, it's really great. It's real time. It's coming from um, web, mobile, and any other kind of distributed source so we provide widgets for our pre-saves and our smart links and that doesn't preclude any of the data from flowing back and you can see the channels that the data is coming from so to your point you can use channel tracking to say okay put this link on twitter put this link on facebook put this link on instagram so on and so forth youtube print ad press release any of the above and truly understand what channels are, are performing best in real time and then when you think about how you want to market against channels or iterate on your marketing and optimize and improve, you know where you should be doubling down. So you can understand, okay, most of my traffic is coming to me from Instagram and clicking to Spotify. So that's a behavior that you know of your fan base. And you can use to kind of influence the way that you leverage the rest of the data, whether it's territory, time of day, any of the other kind of you know, definable demographics, age, gender, so on and so forth to color your marketing campaign. It's to, it's to be used in real time. You know, it's not like there's a golden bullet or a silver bullet rather uh, with this data that helps you understand what to do with it. It's yeah. referenced regularly and understanding it and using Feature FM, frankly, as a resource to, to help digest it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the action page, is yeah. that the landing page when you click on the URL or, or is that different? An action page is something that we've built for when you want fans to take a specific action on a specific platform. Like, so for example? We talked to tons of marketers, and they said, okay, the song is out, right? And I want people to save the song. I don't want them to see all of the stores that they can listen to the song on. I want them to save it or add it to a playlist. Yeah. And so it was clear that there was a feature to be built there, and we built it, which is the action page. So it's allowing fans to, let's say, add a song to their library. And in so doing, they authenticate their profile. They just click once, the song is added. Much like a pre-save, there's a data capture exchange that happens there as well. And so you can use it as a contesting functionality. You can gamify it. You can reroute fans to different experiences. So it can ultimately be 
used at the discretion of the marketer, but it's for when fans want to take a specific action on a specific platform. So, and that's live on Spotify and Apple Music right now? That's right, and YouTube is, is shortly to follow. Can Michael, can you speak to one of, one of your interesting feature offerings, which um, I think separates you from most other people, is the advertising that you yeah. that, that, that you offer. Can you talk about what that is, how that works, um, how, um, how, how a DIY artist could utilize it? Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually where Future Fund started as a company. Uh, was on the advertising side of things. Um, and this marketing okay. that we just kind of discussed, all of the pre-saves, smart links, and the action pages, that's the marketing suite, kind of rolls into this audience CRM. The advertising suite was totally solid, totally separate when we started as a company. And now we're lucky enough that the platforms and the data all kind of talk to each other, which is ultimately why uh, we want to be as multi-platform as possible, right? The data gets richer. But advertising is, is where we started as a business, like I said. And it was with a pretty simple concept, which was the sponsored song. Uh, the sponsored song is uh, likened to being able to boost a post on social media, but native within music, ultimately. How do I get my song to replace an ad on an ad-supported tier of a streaming service? Native music advertising, boosted songs, sponsored songs. That was the concept. This was in... I don't know, 2013, 14, you know, streaming is still ultimately at its infancy, but this was really, really early days. Right. We're still figuring out ad support it in many respects. Um, and there are, you know, all of these metrics that you're thinking about, like CPMs and such. But the reality of the situation is that when someone's listening to music on a streaming platform, they're not there to hear about car insurance. Just, we know that. Behaviorally, we know that. And so we built the sponsor song to replace what's otherwise a very intrusive ad with a song, and that song can be purchased effectively by an artist, like you said, independent, or many major labels use this functionality to ensure that their artists are getting in front of new users in a native listing environment. So this sponsored song is rolled out with Deezer, and that's our first and biggest partner. Um, audio, uh, we'll scratch that. That's There's a partnership coming down the line, uh, but for the time being, it's predominantly mm -hmm. Deezer, Eight tracks as well, so that's mm -hmm. and Sui Musica, which is a regional player in Brazil, and so this kind of native music advertising has provided us metrics that, compared to other display networks, are much higher click throughs for music. Right, it's native. Yeah, in many I mean, clearly the big beast in the room, you know, on the ad supported front would be Spotify, and and of course you're thinking about them. I mean. It, to me, that would make so much more sense for the 100 million people that are listening to Spotify ad-supported, to your point, instead of a, you know, a jarring ad coming on for shoes or tampons, it's a, it's a song, and if they happen to be listening to a certain genre or mood, it would be form-fit, so it would just play in there and not you know, be so jarring. Is yes. that kind of the long-term goal? Yeah, I mean, we want to be platform agnostic. We want to be in all ad supported platforms, right? Um, right now, Spotify has a pretty interesting ad suite offering. Um, I've played around with it as an independent label owner. It's, an, it's a voiceover ad, though. So it's implicitly um, intrusive, right? It's not the song. Um, it's ultimately directing to the song or some other action or click through, which is meaningful for many but not for all consumers. And so we, we think that, yes, yeah, Spotify could be a really great partner for this kind of tool, but there's a, a learning to be had as well, which is to say, is the sponsored song meant for all platforms? It may not be, right? right. In which case, we want to integrate Spotify's advertising offering into Feature FM. So independent artists, labels, whoever can log into Feature FM and still have access to these other tools in other platforms. As long as it was designated and you said this is a sponsored song, you it's know, where it didn't get into like playola, yeah. you know, that I can see how that could be a little tricky. Yeah, so it's it's totally dictated to the listener uh, that it's a sponsored song. There's a little ding and it's a sponsored song and there's a little watermark on the art. It says sponsored track. The nice thing about it though is that all of the actions are still native. So you can add it to a playlist, share it with a friend, add it to your favorites. And then we right. were those things so, so, I like so that. Let, let me let me real quick to that point so if they were to 
play that sponsored song or add it to a playlist, is the is it the original song that's getting added or is it another a new version? No, yeah, it's the original song. Okay. So we built this integration in, in specific to this case with, with Deezer. So in our platform, you search their catalog or drop in a UPC or ISRC, find the song in their library, and that's what you're advertising. And so when a user adds it to their favorites or shares it with a friend or puts it on a playlist, all of the subsequent listens are of that track, which that's, you that's, generate. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So, and, and let me ask you the specifics about what that sponsored song sounds like. Uh, first question, is it the entire song or is it 30 seconds, 45 seconds? And can you tag on an audio trailer of the artist saying, you know, head over here, check, do, you know, promoting something. Visit my artist page, yeah. whatever. Yeah, great question. So um, it's the full song, which is why it's, I think, mostly wow. very, very unique, right? And we report against when in the song people skip. So that's, that's what I was going to ask you about the skip rate. Interesting, right? Because a lot of distributors won't even provide skip rates on songs that are being monetized. Right? This is a song we're ultimately paying to put out there. You, you, can, you should be able to see the skip rate. Yeah. We report against that. Um, and then to the second point, there's no bumper. There's no radio bumper, if you will, voiceover, if you will. But you can customize the art or what's displayed as well as the call to action. So if you want to put a tour poster there instead of the cover, you can. Instead of having it say, learn more, or go to my artist profile, it can click out to tour dates. So okay. the user can only customize the CTA that's displayed. Gotcha. And what, what kind of budgets are typically required for something like this? You know, when I work with a lot of indie artists, when you talk about advertising, their eyes just glaze over and they're like, yeah, like I've got thousands of dollars to spend <laughs> yeah. on advertising. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I sympathize with that. It's... Um, it's very cost effective. Uh, minimum spends fifty dollars. Uh, we see it scale up, and frankly, what I tend to say to our partners is, you know, do a small spend, even if you have the money, Test do it. and see what works, because the data comes back in real time, and then double down in the markets or the demographics or the genres that prove to work. Right? A/B test it. Yeah, and does it work across all all genres? Yeah, yeah. So what will happen is when you find the song, so long as it's been distributed to Deezer. We'll find the other genres that it's tagged by, and we'll use some audio fingerprinting to inform that. And we also find other similar artists, and we pre-populate that in the parameters for the targeting. Then you can go into territories, you can go into age demographics or brackets, and really kind of cater the campaign to the people you think it'll perform well with. And where does it play? What types of, is it, I, I'm not super familiar. I have Deezer and, and I know they're, you know, pretty strong outside of the U.S. And, you know, I've, I've looked in there, but I'm not super familiar with their kind of playlist. Is it their Deezer curated? Is it their algorithmically kind of created playlist? Is it a mix of the two? Yeah, it's anything that happens for the user on the ad supported tier, right? So it's any time an interruption would happen. So if you're just going through tracks, if you're playing a playlist, if you're playing a oh, I see. curated playlist, there's still going to be an interruption because it's ad supported. And it's when that interruption is mandated that a sponsored song could appear. Gotcha. Um, it would be after you listen to a song, it won't be like you're holding the phone open for an extended period of time and you get like a display ad like you might on a website. Uh, yeah, you have yeah. to be in the listening experience. The song will have to end. And that's when the ad or the interruption will appear. Interesting. Yeah. It happens on web. It happens on mobile. It's quite effective. And, and we're really looking to bring it to more ad-supported platforms. We've gotten positive feedback. The, the click-throughs are just ultimately higher. I mean, the proof is in the pudding, right? Because when you do advertising on other platforms, the song is usually the last thing that the user is getting to. Right. Yeah. And I would imagine it's a meritocracy, right? If you have a great track, you're going to have a lot better, you know, CTR than, than you would. So That's you right. want to make sure that you put your absolute best foot forward. Right. Yeah. That's and, right. and then it would be up to either would it be feature FM who decides where it goes or would Deezer decide where it goes to make sure the fits correct? Um, it, it's open to anyone, right? So, you know, if you think that your song is, you know, reggaeton and deserves to be marketed to folks that are listening to reggaeton, you know, we'll map it. We have an approval system in place. If the song doesn't sound good or if it's a joke or if it's running water for 30 minutes, we're not going to 
we're not going to let that happen. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's exactly a meritocracy. The song also has to hit pretty quickly, right? Yeah. You want to capture people's attention. It's just Don't like bore us. Get to the chorus. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you, uh, when you said, you know, it can't be running water for 30 minutes, it uh, it jumped into my head. Do you have a limit on the track length? I mean, could somebody have a an eight-minute instrumental song? Opus. Opus, yeah. Or are you pretty much like, yeah, we need three minutes, you know, we need three and a half minutes. I think that's where it would come to our discretion in the approvals yeah. process. If it's, you know, an Explosions in the Sky song and – you know, they're a touring band and they've created an eight minute opus, then they want to advertise that, that's their prerogative and they have the right to do that. We may flag it with them and say, hey, this might not perform as well as a two minute and 30 second song. You may get more skips. Um, yeah, so but, I think- But you, 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 won't, you won't pull the, the Facebook thing of saying, well, we'll take your <laughs> advertising money. It may not perform as well and no. we're going to throttle it back anyway on top of it. Absolutely not. We're not going to put like an orchestra in our remnant inventory because it's all primary inventory, right? It's all getting sourced based on the audio. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, it needs to hit. It needs to, you know, it needs to get there. It can't be a long song. Um, and we do have an approvals process in place where we'll, we'll send back songs if they're not up to snuff or they haven't been mixed or mastered or just gotcha. aren't. Um, yeah. Do you have any um, examples that you could share with us of artists who've done some sponsored songs that have spent... 50 or 100 bucks and you know what did what did they get for a return yeah um well the the cost per play is three cents right so it's a guaranteed number of streams so when you spend five hundred, oh, okay interesting so you'll you'll be played yeah you're always going to get played the inventory is there we will always serve the ad the question is what's the click through based on the number of streams right? you can't control that i mean that's it's got to react it's that's it's right. so <laughs> subjective you could love the track and go flat, right? I mean, it's... Right. So that's where day. we start tweaking the parameters and understanding what might perform based on certain territories. Um, we've had tons of artists, whether major major label artists, uh, independent artists, artists that have their own labels. Um, they gotcha. like to see a direct correlation between ad dollars spent and consumption, right? It's, it's an attribution model that music hasn't done very well in advertising. Yeah, Shifting gears just a little bit, do you think it helps if, if someone puts out, uh, you know, kind of a pre-ad, pre-save, pre-order link, does it help or hurt to have kind of value-add things like, you know, uh, click here to pre-ad and be entered to win a guitar or a signed drum head, or do you deal with those types of things and do they work? Yeah, all the time. I think the, the gamification, the contesting – works better for some artists and their fan bases than others. Yeah. Uh, but I like to see the diversity of the contesting. Some will be, you know, um, a drumstick, which like, I, you know, that's what I'm used to. It's like, how do you, how do you, how do you ship a single drumstick? <laughs> like that's, that becomes the manager's Long, problem. skinny envelope. Right. Exactly. Um, so those are fun, but we also see a lot of people leverage digital assets, right? Cause we can do this redirect, this conditional redirect where it's ultimately um, a link that's hidden behind the action. So you can send people to an experience, a gated experience, a website, video content, tickets, merch. That stuff tends to perform pretty well. Um, Interesting. Yeah, but again, it's always dependent on the audience, right? Sometimes people need to be incentivized. Other times people are just happy to support the artist. Could uh, you focus surrounding a tour? Let's say you know your tour is routed and you know which towns it's going to. Can you do campaigns kind of based on those DMAs? Um, it would probably happen off platform for us, right? You would, you would pretty much create respective contests per market and market those contests on socials in those territories, right? So you would target, you know, the widget, the contest, the action page, the pre-save to Wichita, if it's a contest for Wichita. Gotcha. Uh, so it's, it's, this is where we become, you know, uh, or this is where I like to refer to us as like a Swiss army knife. Right, we have a lot of these tools. You ultimately flip them out based on your objectives. Um, so sometimes we'll be able to kind of support across the whole release cycle. Other times you're going to have objectives where maybe portion of our offering will better suit those objectives. Um, yeah, that'd be so, cool, kind of with tickets or something, or yeah. 
meet and greets or I was just kind of thinking about, you know, maybe being a little bit more surgical about it, but I get it. So, yeah, we, so the, 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 the million dollar question that artists are going to have is this sounds great. And these are amazing tool sets. How much does it cost me to use them? Yeah. What, what's your pricing structure? Yeah. So um, the only part of our product that's kind of siloed, right? I mentioned before that our advertising and marketing are married effectively. The only part of that is that they're siloed in pricing because advertising is priced in terms of what you spend is what it right. costs. Right. So it's a freemium model. You can log onto the platform. You can leverage the advertising platform for whatever you want to spend, minimum spend being $50. So that's available to anyone. The marketing suite is a subscription basis. And that scales based on usage and based on features and functions. So if you're a very basic user, you're not really dabbling in retargeting or anything that would kind of be a little bit more advanced, then you're paying $19.99 a month, right? We have annual plans where things get chopped down. Sure. And then you work up from $19.99 based on retargeting parameters, based on subdomains, based on things that might be more vanity oriented. Or volume, just, volume of usage, can, maybe. Can, can, it, can a user... You know, they sit here and go, okay, I, I'll, I'll pay the nineteen ninety nine a month for the next six months because I'm actively working this release. Six months is up and the release is done, it's over. Can they throttle back to some free level that they can't use the service, but you don't remove the account and all the data that's been Yeah, gathered. because you're out of the release cycle. You're out of the yeah. release cycle. So they come back next year and then they can just re resubscribe re again and they can build off of everything they had from a year ago. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So if you decide that you want to just come month to month, by all means, we see a lot of independent artists do that. Right? Labels are active year-round, so subscriptions make sense. Artists or other indies might want to be a little bit more seasonal or surgical with it, and will come on three to six months. If they decide to downgrade, the links will stay live, they'll stay active. If you're at a higher tier, like our pro or advanced tiers, and you downgrade to basic, the retargeting pixels will no longer fire. That's the one thing to note. However, if you're a basic user and you downgrade to free, the link will continue to function. You can log into FeatureFM. You can see the data. You just can't see any future data, and you can't edit the link. But the second you resubscribe, those gates are lifted, and you can leverage it. So, and 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 is the nineteen, you know, the 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 monthly subscription is that? per release or can you have as many releases as you want using all the marketing tools for the one fee? Yeah, it's an all-you-can-eat model in terms of number of releases. The things that will limit are certain things like number of subdomains, right? So if you wanted to have like, you know, um, artist name dot FFM dot TO, there are limits on that. If you wanted to have multiple retargeting pixels or multiple different territories that you manage, these are things that are a little bit more advanced than, you know, we would discuss those. But, um, yeah, for the most part, it's an all-you-can-eat model for the number of releases that you're able to work. And, and would there be any difference if it was uh, an indie label, a management company, marketing <laughs> people coming in where we represent and work with artists coming and going? Would we set up the same account or do you have a, a, a different designation for industry people? Yeah, same kind of account. Um, we pretty much have a folder settings, right? So that if you're a label, maybe your folders are artists. If you're a distributor, maybe your folders are labels. If you're an agency, your folders are however you decide to organize them. Agencies are right. all places, right. they're all different. But we provide that kind of optionality. It's the same kind of account. It's just really a matter of how you optimize the organization of the account. And, and, we'll and can, yeah. can you can you set up team members? Can you yeah, grant different levels of access? So, example, you know, if Jay and I are working with artists, we want to give artist X Y Z access to their data and their tool sets, but we don't want them to see our other clients. Is that yeah. all manageable? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have multi-user access with read and write functionality based on folders. So you can invite someone to one folder, and they can see the access on that, where they can't see anything else. Um, separately, if people are not involved or invested in logging into a platform, which some artists may not be, uh, you can just send them a live link. So you're able to share the analytics from the back end. Gotcha. So you just gotcha. click on that link whenever they want, they'll see an update. 
Yeah. So these links that we're talking about, when you click on that smart URL, for lack of a better term, and the landing page comes up and it has you know, Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, uh, Amazon Music, whatever it has in there, is it geo-aware, meaning like if I'm in London and I click on that, is it going to take me to the U.S. Uh, version or is it going to take me to the local U.K. version? Of those DSPs? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's often kind of like, it's multifaceted, right? Because it's not just um, the UPC or the ISRC that's relevant to that territory. Maybe you've carved out territories, but it's also the language. Maybe it's store order, right? These are all of the kind of territory management things that all of, um, all of our kind of more advanced users are very keen on. So yeah, all of that's handled in the platform. Let me ask you about the, the, the setup. So in in the past, traditionally, creating a smart link, you couldn't create a smart link until your 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 product was actually live, so you could go grab the URL, which meant there's a lot of scurrying at the very last minute when yeah. it goes live at 9 p.m. on a Thursday night when yeah. when Apple pushes stuff live. Now you know now the marketing team and everybody's scrambling to build your smart links. Yeah. Do you have the ability to pre-build these things and will you automatically populate it or how does yeah, that work? It's, it's a great question. And again, it's twofold, right? So there's the pre-save, right? So if you have a marketing strategy before the release date, um, you, we don't require a URL or a live link to create the pre-save. You just plug in the relevant information with the kind of cover art, release title, and the rest. And all we require is that you do have that URL or URI or UPC or ISRC either right before or upon release. At some point, yeah. Point. And we'll scan that and we'll populate all of the services. So that would be for a pre-save. We have something also called a scheduled landing page or scheduled release landing page. So let's say it's Monday, right? And your publicist is sending around a press release earlier in the week for a release that comes out Friday, right? And you don't want people to be clicking to a link that's dead or a release that they're not yet to hear. And so you're able to set up a scheduled landing page. So that you drop in a URL or UPC or ISRC for when you have it, schedule the release, and it will convert from a countdown clock to the landing page on that release date. So again, there are two different versions where you, we don't require a UPC, ISRC, URL, anything identifiable to actually get the page live and out in the wild. There are some things that you'll need to do if you don't get ahead of it around the time of release, but it's never an instance where you're going to be scrambling for a URL to plug it in to get something live. The page itself will already be live. And, and, and I assume that besides all of the, the big DSPs, if, if an artist wanted to throw a link into the landing page that was my official store to buy my bundles, yep. it could just be a manual setup of here, here's the destination and add it to the landing page. That's exactly right. So we have hundreds and hundreds of stores as well. So other independent retailers, physical retailers, regional retailers, or if you're an artist with a custom store and you want your logo, we'll accommodate that. Um, and of course, it's not going to auto populate, right? Because a lot of these right. artists stores are not as advanced and don't have these APIs that the other DSPs right. do. Um, so there might be something manual that's required there. But yeah, the vanity of it is quite nice. I like I like when we see artists use their own stores. Yeah. The, the, this is this is awesome. I mean, I think the the whole smart link um, technology and marketing set are something all artists need to be looking at. Uh, yeah. You know, it, m m releasing music has become very complicated and busy in in this new modern business, and a tool set like this simplifies it. But I'm equally excited and interested in the advertising side of your business because, you know, sometimes you've got some clients who are just like, "Hey, I I I got to have a hundred thousand streams." for whatever reason, to show somebody, to impress somebody, whatever, you know, God knows the reasons artists have for some of their demands. But you could just sit here and go, okay, well, it's three cents a stream. Just give me the budget and we'll get them to you. Yeah. It's real people, real listening. It's not like, it's it's not the, the fake accounts that people buy when they pump up their numbers on YouTube. These are real people streaming. Yeah. I mean, these are not vanity metrics, right? Like our ethos as a business is to help artists and the people that work with artists um, obtain, own, control, re-engage their fan bases that are rightfully theirs, right? Whether it's marketing or advertising, it's not a world in which you're leaving a record store with a record under your arm. The label's going, 
cool, he sold the record. I wonder who it was, right? This is a world in which we can disintermediate the supply chain of data and provide it back to the people that deserve it and know how to use it. So whether it's generating streams because you're effective with your advertising or running an effective pre-release marketing campaign to hype up your release radar, right? There's so many yeah. different ways that artists and their teams are working now. And you're right, it needs to be simplified. It's unfair to the artist and to their teams for this stuff to not be simplified. There's just... yeah. Just think about it. And, and, it yeah. sure would make the Spotify free tier more interesting. I hope you guys crack that uh, nut. Yeah, thanks. And, and, and I think it's I think it's pretty obvious, but for more information, you go to feature.fm. That's right. And I'm happy to talk with whoever always. Uh, I'm New York based, so Michael S at feature.fm. If anybody ever wants to reach out directly, that, that, that's awesome. I, I totally encourage uh, all the Music Biz Weekly listeners to check out Feature FM. I mean, you you need a marketing toolbox like this, yeah. and and I I, I and Joe Joe Jay, you could probably um, confirm the yeah. less separate toolboxes you have the better it's like yeah, yeah i don't want to go to this website to do this one feature it's a cool feature but just it does one thing and then you go here to do this and here it's great when you can find people that throw it all into one platform yeah and i've been using it for a while and i've been really impressed but i i haven't tried you know some of these other features that you're talking about and i look forward to doing that michael thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy day to come talk with us it's been uh, very educational yeah, I appreciate the time, guys. This was thank you, Michael. Fun. So fascinating discussion. Loved it. I love tool sets like this. I love features yeah. like this. And 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 I was first introduced to Feature.fm through the advertising platform. I remember seeing that when it first mm -hmm. came out. And, yeah. And I was just like back then. I was just like, hmm. I couldn't quite envision the purpose of it because as 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 Michael said. Streaming was at its infancy when that right. was first yeah. launched, so people really didn't know what to do. But mm -hmm. now, as it's matured, yeah, that's a great tool set to be able for yeah. three cents a stream. That's crazy. And, you know, there's so much functionality there. Um, you might want to take notes, you know, yeah. or just just try it out because it, it does so much. But if you're not using, you know, smart URLs in your uh, business in music, then you need help with your digital strategy you, because you, they're key. You really do. If 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 your if your marketing and promotion consists of a post that says, go to iTunes and here's the link to it on <laughs> iTunes in the U.S. store, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there you go. Music Biz Weekly Podcast, another week. As always, we'd love it if you subscribe on YouTube. Head over to iTunes, leave us a review and rating, and we'll see you next week.